Good morning, everyone. Hello, and welcome to Ted Hopkins 2021. This is our fifth annual presentation of TED Talks that focus on issues that affect our environment. Every year we have tried to enhance the experience through adding more components and elements of professionalism. This year we have the addition of these lovely TED Talk mics. Over the years I have been so impressed with the Hopkins students' level of commitment to their topics and research. And I have expanded my own knowledge of these pressing issues by learning from these students. I am very grateful for their work to educate their peers, their teachers, and the community. Gen Z has repeatedly demonstrated superior understanding and awareness of the threats to the environment that we currently face. They have spoken out on these issues and have implored other generations to follow their lead in a crusade to save the many species of our planet. They have shown compassion and humanity, in the best sense of that word, in their heartfelt entreaties that the human race take responsibility for our actions, change our harmful habits, and act as stewards of the earth by cultivating a healthy relationship with our environment. I hope that these students and their generation will serve as an example for others to follow in their dedication to the cause and their efforts to increase awareness regarding issues of utmost importance. I hope you will enjoy our program today. Thank you very much for attending. And now it is my honor and privilege to introduce our first speakers, Ada Bethe and Yves Lanzafama. Thank you for that introduction, Ms. Lama. I am Yves Lanzafama. And I'm Ava Tay, and this is Busting Grass. We're going to provide for you guys today a case against American lawn culture and, uh, you know, kind of describe the environmental issues that come with manicured grass in your yards. So, to start with a little bit of a history lesson. Uh, the 1950s, right, the rise of kind of suburbia, the new American dream, right? Everyone wanted the perfect home, the perfect car, and the... Uh, you know, the perfect family, 2.5 kids, classic. But most importantly, everyone wanted the perfect lawn. You know, like the greenest grass, the most uniform it could possibly be. And maybe kind of the idea of suburbia as a whole has faded in our culture, but the, the idea of the perfect lawn has absolutely not. Um, like the relationship between nice lawns, reputation, and class has been around for a lot longer than we think. Um, to go back to 1950s, here's a clip from a magazine in which this man here, dressed in his nice Sunday best, is, uh, is rejecting his other pastimes and, you know, this lovely lady, the love of his life, in order to have a nice lawn. Um, you know, even like the grass beforehand, it looks so nice, right? It looks so green, but he, he prefers to have his grass just fully mowed down, to speak legitimately. And to go a little further back to that, Here's a quote from The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald, which was published in 1925. Um, and this book is famous for its commentary on class roles and social expectations, so keep that in mind when I read this book. So, J. Gatsby, who's like a very rich man in the story, says to his friend Nick, who is not as rich, um, I want to get the grass cut. We both looked at the grass. There was a sharp line where my ragged lawn ended and the darker, well-kept expanse of his began. I, suspe I suspected that he meant my grass. And then Gatsby goes on to say, old sport, you don't make much money, do you? So obviously, this shows the class disparity. Um, and I'm almost positive that the bill put this in the book to show class issues. And to go further back from the 1920s, here's a screenshot from an American history TV video in which a man dressed up as Thomas Jefferson explains his love of gardening and estate planning at his uh, at Monticello. And this is actually true. Um, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington both really loved the, the landscapes of the wealthy English gentry in their homes. And um, obviously it wasn't Thomas Jefferson doing his own gardening, which you know shows class issues in a different way, but also like land owning and this kind of thing, they were very important, you know, to be able to perform civic duties. So of course you wanted your land to look better than everyone else's land. 
Um, but there are other reasons, you know. Obviously, it's not the fault of the homeowners that this culture has existed for so long, and that the quality of law is directly related to reputation. Um, like, you know, for example, this house right here, maybe the, it's kind of the new American dream in the way, like the buzzwords are the same, big house, nice view, and acres and acres of beautiful green grass, but it's new, and it's different. And uh, another new thing, um, and you know, something very present in our culture today, is economic reasons. Why do people want good lawns? Um, simple lawn maintenance, which includes mowing a lot, pesticides, chemical fertilizers, that kind of thing, that can lead to a 100 to 200% return on investment for your homes. And actually adding turf grass to your lawns can uh, increase the value of your home up to 15%. So obviously the people who have the time and the money and the physical capability to take care of their lawns are going to have better success in the housing market overall and just like in the economy of America. But what about the people who don't have the time and the money and the physical capability to take care of their lawns? Well, there are actually municipal lawn care laws, laws in a lot of uh, counties around the country. Um, which aren't strictly enforced most of the time, but when they are, they are. Um, for example, a woman named Ebony Connor in Illinois in 2016 was arrested for not mowing her lawn and was kept in jail for like a few days. And a Florida man in 2019 was charged $30,000 for allowing his lawn to grow over 10 inches. So now we're kind of getting into the tough stuff, right? Why is this actually a problem? Overall, Americans spend $20 billion a year on lawns, and, you know, probably a lot of us don't spend that much money, so, like, how much money are the people who are spending money actually spending? Um, this is not sustainable for a lot of Americans. Another fact is that manicured grass is the number one crop in America. It's actually three times larger than irrigated corn, and so, uh, and most of this manicured grass is centralized in upper-class areas, like, golf courses, or Jane Austen novel estates, that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> and with all of this grass, of course there's going to be a lot of water use, right? So about 67,500 gallons of water are used per American every year. That's per American. And a lot of us, I'm sure, don't really water our lawns that frequently. So how much water are the people who are watering their lawns actually using? Um, and with 35 million families using toxins on their lawns every year, Homeowners use 10 times the amount of pesticides uh, that farmers use on their lawns, that farmers use on like all of their farms. And pesticides have always kind of been a major issue in environmental spaces. For example, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, which was published in 1962, which was kind of after the rise of suburban propaganda and the types of billboards that I showed earlier, and I can think of one back to the future one. Um, this brought, like, brought to light issues with DDT, which was like a very uh, harsh chemical and really had detrimental impacts on the environment. But even after all this work and the government's ban on DDT, there's still a lot of work to be done surrounding pesticides. Um, so now we have a history and some introduction to some of the issues, but let's get into some of the more environmental aspects. Like Ada said, up to 10 times more pesticides are used on lawns than by farmers. And we've all heard of pesticides and their use in negative effects. But what do they actually do? Pesticides make, visually, they make your lawn appear to be much healthier than it is, but it doesn't address the issue behind why your lawn is dead. Generally, your grass is having issues from poor soil, maybe the climate, poor previous care, um, all of which are not issues that can be solved by using pesticides. In fact, by using pesticides, it generally only disrupts the soil cycle and makes the lawn become dependent on these pesticides, which of course only contributes to more pesticide use, hence the 70 million pounds of pesticides that are used annually. Um, not only does this pesticide use have an effect on the environment, but there are also profound effects on ecosystems and animals in surrounding areas. The insects, for example, maybe the bees, are directly affected from this pesticide application, and so there it can work its way up the food chain, maybe rodents like mice eat these insects, or maybe they leach into the streams and then fish are affected, and the birds that eat these fish are then affected, maybe there's chemical leaching on roads, which larger animals like bighorn sheep might like for the salt. So there are quite profound effects on both the environment and the animals. 
Um, another issue is in gas, which is very closely associated with lawn care, maybe re-wrapping or mowing. Um, but 200 million gallons of gas is used annually by Americans on lawns, and that doesn't even include the 15 million gallons that are spilled every year. These gases are obviously disposed of as greenhouse gases, which contribute to larger issues like global warming and damage to ozone layers and leave quite a significant impact on the environment. You can see mowing has one of the highest emissions of gases, um, but this does not only affect the environment, but humans as well. For example, nitrogen oxide, which is in this gas, is harmful to central nervous systems. Carbon monoxide in these gases can cause heart disease as the chemicals try to replace oxygen in the bloodstream. And um, habitat destruction is also quite a significant issue as well. The idea of implementing a perfect lawn on your lawn makes hundreds of thousands of people every year for trees and bushes and plants and the natural soils out, uh, which obviously the animals rely on and depend on for their homes. You can see they go from living in a luscious green forest with plenty of materials to make a home and then suddenly have to find a way to live or are pushed out of their home to for these perfectly striped green lawns, which is not sustainable for them. Um, another issue with this is it also causes a lot of endangerment for animals. On a much larger scale, this is seen with tigers, elephants, and rhinos, but on a more relevant scale to lawn care, um, specifically hedgehogs and turtles are seeing are facing dangerous levels of endangerment and hopefully not, but possibly extinction. Um, Obviously, like Linda said, 67,500 gallons of water are used annually on logs per American, which unsurprisingly is one of the leading causes of droughts. Um, not only is it a leading cause of droughts, but once these droughts are caused, people still find the need to water their logs. Um, if you look up what to do during a drought for your log care, it still says to water your logs. That's not helpful um, because a lot of this is um, water that, once it's used, creates high demands and pressures on the earth to provide enough, even for basic things like showering and drinking water, when the millions of gallons are being used on logs. Um, another very common issue is stormwater runoff, uh, which is a major issue in terms of heavily chemicalized logs. And I'm going to do a little demonstration, so if you'd like to come closer, um, it looks like there's enough seats up front if you would like to. Uh, so let me describe the process a little bit here. So let's say that Bob likes his lawn very, very clean, very neat and organized. He wants it to look healthy, so he uses pesticides. Here go the pesticides. Now, we have pesticides on the lawn, and it looks luscious and green and gorgeous. But now, here comes the storm. Now let's watch what happens as the storm water hits the roof, goes into the gutters, down the gutters, and over the wall. You can probably see that it's going down the gutter, across the lawn. Maybe there is a road there that's carrying, that's got an oil spill on it for cars. So it's taking all the pesticides off the lawn. It's getting oils from the roads. It's getting maybe debris on the roads. It's going down into the storm drain, which is just a drain you might see on the side of the road, just a little break. And these drains are often deposited into rivers, lakes, oceans. Maybe this is your reservoir for the town that supplies the water source. And now, when it goes off for treatment, it's got pesticides and oils and all sorts of chemicals on it. Um, so what are some things that we can do about this? You know, we've been talking a lot about the issues that, you know, come, uh, affect the environment, but you're probably wondering what exactly you can do, because you want your lawns to look nice, right? But you also don't want to kill all these animals and uh, destroy your drinking source. So we're going to talk about some uh, some solutions here. And these are the main ones we're going to talk about. You've got your classic rainwater barrels. You've got your permeable surfaces that you can uh, use to build parts of your landscapes. And of course, biodiversity. So you've probably seen rainwater barrels maybe just in driving by, but they're generally just a plastic or wooden barrel that you simply, I'm going to use this little cup, that you simply put at the bottom of your gutter to collect rainwater. So now let's see what happens when a storm hits. Rainwater goes down the gutter, and you can see, I hope you can see, that it is filling this barrel. 
Now, our water is manually collected in this barrel. Why is this so helpful? Well, you probably noticed that there was no runoff. None of this water went down the storm drain. Our reservoir did fill with more pesticides. Not only that, the water that is now in this barrel can be used to water your lawn. This is fantastic because the water, the rainwater that has natural nutrients is actually much healthier for your lawn than the treated water that has phosphates and nitrogen and chlorine, which is not necessarily helpful for your lawn. It's obviously more cost efficient and more efficient for water because you don't need as much water coming from the hose to just use rainwater. Um, another great thing that you know free to use was permeable surfaces. As you can see in this case, there was maybe a road or a driveway or a walkway that's collecting water and just funneling it down into a storm drain. But permeable surfaces, anything that allows liquids or gases to pass through it, will have a much different result. You can see here there's rocks, stone pavers, maybe bricks. There, I'm going to be using this paper towel. I don't suggest you make your driveway out of paper towels, but for the sake of the demonstration, I'm going to be using paper towel. So there's our permeable surface. We're going to put it down. And now let's see what happens when the storm hits. I'm not sure how late you can see this, but the water is being absorbed onto this paper towel, our permeable surface. And there is still a little bit of runoff that's going into the reservoir, but a lot of it is captured in this towel, which means it's soaking into the ground. Uh, this is really great because it reduces runoff. As you can see, there were much less pesticides being run into our reservoir. It's also fantastic for groundwater because the water that seeps into the ground is now going to be, maybe it goes to an aquifer or a well, which is a drinking source. And um, if you don't use pesticides on your lawn, that's absolutely fantastic because now you have perfectly clean water as your well source or your aquifer. Um, another really important thing that Ada previewed was biodiversity and introducing biodiversity. This is a really crucial aspect of keeping lawns beneficial and healthy for the environment. Um, generally, this just means allowing sections of your lawn that are purposefully not mowed, as you can see there's maybe walkways or gardens, um, little mowed areas, but around it there's a lot of bushes and natural things that are just allowed to grow. This is fantastic because it allows cleaner air and cleaner water. Um, another, an issue with biodiversity is that people tend to use the same aesthetic plants to uh, landscape their houses, which is an issue for other plants because maybe they're destroying habitat destruction, which in turn means that they're not being used, and maybe that leads to their endangerment and extinction as well. So it's really important to allow natural plants to grow. Um, it's also very important to limit, to limit, if not eliminate, the use of pesticides for um, natural soil cycles and to allow the natural plants to thrive. Now we've been talking a lot about what you should do, should do, and what a healthy lawn looks like. So I'm going to show you what I think a beautiful, healthy lawn looks like. As you can see here, on the side there, we've got a little bit of mowing, maybe a little walkway. Possibly the area in this gate is, you know, mowed for no play area. But generally, for the most part, you can say the majority of this lawn is covered in wildflowers, and it's like a little prairie. And in my humble opinion, I think that is absolutely beautiful. Some other lawns that we like, uh, that we think are perfect for the environment, look like this. Look at all that. Look at all those native plants in that garden. Maybe there's like a little bird back there, perfect for animals and you know for biodiversity. Like I said, there's also this lawn, kind of the same deal here. And of course, this. This is a moss lawn, um, and moss is great for the ground, great for uh, for the ecosystem of your lawn. Also, they've got a permeable surface walkway here. Like you said, great for groundwater, great for that kind of thing. So these might not look like the most perfect lawns to you guys. This is exactly the type of thinking that we kind of want to change and that we think everyone can work to change. You know, people are already, um, you know, finding wildflowers and more natural looking lawns to be nicer and, uh, and just like prettier in general. So if that makes you feel better. Um, variety of landscaping has already yeah, already become more and more pleasing to people. And like Eve said, designating areas for native plants and for higher grass, uh, that's great. It can be in your backyard. No one has to see it. You know, when they're walking by, you can just keep it hidden. But as long as you're kind of um, actively thinking about what you can do for animal habitats and for native plant growth, that kind of thing, you're doing great. You're doing great. So we recommend, you know, start thinking actively about the impacts of your family's lawn maintenance. 
what can you do to lead to the sustainability of your lawns? If you want to keep them around for a long time, if you want to keep animals around for a long time, or plants around for a long time, um, think about every time you mow your lawn, how often do you do it? Or what kind of pesticides do you use? That kind of thing. Um, or, you know, maybe you don't even have to think about it. Just tell your dad. Tell your dad to stop mowing his lawn every few days. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, thank you. And today we are going to be talking about the oh no layer and how having nice hair killed the ozone. So in order for us to realize what the problem is and how to solve it, we have to know what the ozone layer is. So the ozone layer is located in the second layer of the atmosphere, 15 to 30 kilometers above Earth's surface, and it wraps around the entirety of the Earth. So a lot of people think that the ozone layer protects the planet from like global warming and stuff, but that's just not true. It actually helps defend against the Earth's harmful UV lights. So what goes on in the ozone layer? Although oxygen, 21% of all molecules in the atmosphere are oxygen, there's only three ozone molecules for every 10 million molecules of everything. So luckily for us, these molecules, one can make a huge difference. So when the sun's UV lights combine with O3, it splits into 1O2 and 1O1. And these O1s can react with other O1s to make O2, or they can react with another O2 and create ozone. So it's like a recycling process. So why is it so dangerous for us to not have an ozone there? there the sun lets off three different rays, UVC, UVB, and UVA. They're all pretty much the same thing, just different strengths and different wavelengths. UVC have stronger or more rapid wavelengths, making them more dangerous. But luckily for us, the ozone uh, absorbs 99% of UVC rays. UVB rays, it absorbs 90%. And UVA, it only absorbs 50 because it's not the UVA light aren't strong enough to break through the ozone. So what happens is when these rays hit ozone, the energy causes it to break apart the bonds, which absorbs it, so it can't reach Earth's surface. These rays can cause skin cancer, aging, eye damage, weakened immune systems, and mutations. UVC obviously has more effective damage than UVB and A. So what's the problem? Problem is, in 1980, Aerosol came out with a hairspray that did that. This is the ozone hole. So the ozone hole is an area over the Antarctica where there's less dense ozone compared to all around the world. So when people sprayed it and fixed up their mullets and big fluffy hairdos, it put toxics in the air which brought it all the way down to Antarctica and got trapped because of the polar vortex, which is pretty much circular winds that don't let anything in or out. So what are these chemicals that actually do the damage? They have huge names, chlorofluorocarbons, hydrofluorofluorocarbons, and halines. And what they do, they, they're strong bonds, so they can stay together for a long time, meaning they can float up to the first and second layers of the atmosphere. And once they finally get up there, the UV rays finally begin to bring them down after the world winds bring them to Antarctica. And once they break apart, chlorine is let free. And chlorine is actually what kills the ozone. One chlorine molecule can 
take apart 1,000 ozone molecules before it's naturally sustained, and that's why they're so dangerous. So, why should you even care if what you use in the United States just goes to Antarctica anyway? Well, first off, it still affects you too. It's, they can stay above yours, your hemisphere, they just move it towards Antarctica. And what the UV rays do to species in Antarctica, they reduce plant growth and coral growth. Plankton's survival rate goes way down. Fish and other marine animals, their reproductive system is greatly affected, meaning they have a harder time making more fish babies. And it, when the some of the ozone hole can travel over to land where humans live, and it can directly affect humans. So with less plankton, there's less food for the fish, and the fish are already having a harder time reproducing. And then bigger fish can't eat as many fish, and we eat those fish. So it's all affecting the food chain negatively. So what did, what did we do about it? In 1987, the UN came together and we devised a plan to address the ozone hole. This plan was called the Montreal Protocol. So what they did in this was uh, they banned the process of any ozone depleting substances. So in January 2010 is when all the countries in the UN decided that they were going to be a part of this and stop using it. Just one year later, 97% of ozone depleting substances were no longer in commercial use. Obviously, they're still in the air right now because we have an ozone hole still, but it began the healing process. So this is what it was like before we started using ozone depleting substances. This was what it was like four years ago. That was pretty much at its prime. And it's predicted that by 2070, the ozone hole will be nearly fully healed. So, why should we, why am I even showing you this if the problem's pretty much healed? Well, that's because we can see this as an inspiration that no matter how badly we screw up, we can always make a comeback. And we can use this as faith to help us against uh, warming, global warming, overuse of greenhouse gases, endangered species, and other things. Thank you. Okay. My name is Tanner Seelig. Hello. My name is Tanner Seelig. And I'm here with my partner, Carter Beckwith, and John Hanscom. And today we're going to be talking to all of you guys a little bit about sloths. And I'm sure you all know, and maybe the only thing you do know about sloths, is that they're the slowest animal on Earth. And that's true. Um, but there are also many different types of sloths, and by many I mean six. But today I'm going to be talking to you about the Bradpus pygmas. Um, which is just a pygmy three-toed sloth. Um, one of its main distinctions is that it has three toes. So, this sloth um, is, again, one of six species, and it lives on Ezra Squad de Veraguas, which is just off the coast of Panama. Um, it's one of the only species um, of sloths that is labeled as critically endangered. And that's because in the last eight or so years, its population has almost been cut in half. Um, the sloth weighs about 5.5 to 7.7 .7 pounds, and it ranges from 19 to 21 inches, and it is the smallest sloth to this. So the sloth faces a lot of danger, of course, making it critically endangered. And just to touch on it real quick, it's human interaction 
and have pet exploitation that is really causing the sloth to go endangered. And this will all be touched on later. I'm just going to briefly introduce it. And these sloths grow in the mangrove forest of Panama, uh, which is not very big. There's 26 acres of land that these sloths grow in. And they live on a 4.3 square kilometer island. And that is very small for an island. To give you a sense, have these about 63 square kilometers. So these sloths are living on 1 14th the size of cabbage. Nevertheless, only 26 acres. And these sloths are really confined. You know, they don't have many places to go, not many forests to live in there. But they really do love it there. It's, it's made for them. Um, when you first look at this beautiful island, you think tourists get away, you know, Caribbean. It's a great place to go. But not many people go there. And, and we like that. We don't want many people to go there. And right now it's flourishing. The waters are still crystal blue. And the island itself is part of Bocas del Toro, which is a province located in the Mosquito Gulf. Um, there are many islands in this chain of Bocas del Toro, and they all are very similar with the water and the um, size. However, this is the smallest island out of all five of them so. For a majority of the size of distance, it was uninhabited. It's only been around for 9,000 years, and the sloths have lived there for all 9,000 years. However, only recently have humans became involved with this island. So the sloths live in 10 main areas on this island. They're going to be the red areas on this map. These are called thickets. We have mangrove forest areas. And all 48 remaining sloths live between the 10 areas. Now, there's also coral, the yellow, it's going to be the coral, so that is the sea. And these sloths actually like to live near the sea because they're actually really good swimmers. And their ability to swim is what is keeping the forty alive since they live in the sea most of the time. But every two weeks they do have to go to the ground to proceed to go to the bathroom where their population is rarely cut off by feral cats. Now, another topic of the island shows all the vegetation and some several thickets. And more natural reasons, as I kind of already mentioned, that the sloth is going extinct are feral cats and their inability to run away from these cats. However, these sloths do have some adaptations, very little though. They have camouflage and a very neutral and natural smell to them. There is a specific algae called the Trifilis algae, and this allows the sloth to really blend in with this environment. And this is another reason that the sloth, the three-toed pygmy sloth, can only live on this island because of this symbiotic relationship. However, the symbiotic relationship will not be able to keep the species alive for much longer if we don't continue to put in our own help as humans. And in return to this declining population of sloths due to feral cats and our own touch on the island, scientists and many conservationists have stepped in. Um, different groups, which will also be um, mentioned later and more explained, such as the edge group, have already been developing solutions and monitoring the island a little bit. So different researchers have made their way into the island. However, most of the island, about 85%, is still unexplored. And they've been having sloths, putting some GPSs on them to monitor them in these different thickets to make sure that the population doesn't go down anymore. And another big part is the locals. And the locals, which will again be touched on later, have main control over this island. And the different conservation groups, such as Edge, have been able to get these locals involved with the island and its sustainability. And so far, in 2021, about 160 locals, which doesn't sound like a lot, but again, it's a small island, you know, it's not very small, have been involved in sustainability for the environment projects. 
hosted by Edge, which is a big step forward in the right direction to helping these slots grow again. And the mangrove trees that the sloths live in are what us humans are after. And these sloths love these trees. It's the only place these sloths can live in. And they only eat the mangrove leaves. This is their main diet. And we're just taking it right away from them. We're just taking their shelter and their food. And there's no reason for that. These sloths are one of the most harmless and innocent animals to exist. Again, they provide symbiotic relationships and they take nothing away from us. While living on uninhabited lands, you would think that they'd be completely safe. However, different tourists and fishermen, merchants have gone to this island and taken the mangrove trees from it for the timber. Again, there's only 26 acres of this timber available on the island, and eventually we will run out. <coughs> now, these sloths, um, there's only 48 of them, and they will not survive more than eight years if they continue taking negative trees from this forest. <coughs> now, is it worth making these sloths live their final days? as they watch tourists come onto their island and take away the property? Is it worth building things such as casinos and hotels on the small island and letting the graves of 50 or so sloths sit there for eternity? Is it really worth having these sloths sit there and suffer and fall out of their trees? As sad it is, when we're taking their trees and their home away from them just for our benefit on the small island? It's not. And this is why we need to step in. And we need to put our foot down, and we're not going to watch another species go extinct. Because 160 species of plants and animals have already gone extinct this year from humans alone. And to really study these sloths a little more, and to get a little more involved in their relationship with their habitat and their other relatives of sloths, we're going to have to dive in a little bit more. Thank you. So, a bit of history on the sloth. So, over the last 9,000 years, obviously they've been secluded to this island. And a study was conducted not too long ago by a man named Robert Anderson. And he found that of the Bradypus uh, genus on five different islands in these regions, all of them were smaller than their mainland counterparts. Now, these adaptations are something that is related to a principle called Foster's Rule, or the Island Rule, which is meant to symbolize if there are no known predators of a species, it will get larger, and if it has a lack of resources, it will get smaller. And these principles are referred to as insular gigantism and insular dwarfism. And the pygmy sloth is affected by insular dwarfism. However, it is very crucial for it as it has nowhere to go other than those 26 acres. And to compare the pygmy sloth to one of its mainland counterparts, the brown-throated three-toed sloth, which is the closest relative of the pygmy sloth, is 40% heavier in body mass and 15% larger in length, which is significant amount from the almost seven pounds that a pygmy sloth can reach and the I think at max 20 inches the pygmy sloth can make. And another issue with being stuck on an island is genetic diversity. And although genetic diversity has a lot of problems these sloths have been able to adapt to it over these 9,000 years and through the constant in inbreeding they have eliminated all the previous deadly recessive alleles that could have wiped them out. However, due to all of this, they're stuck with almost the exact same alleles from every single sloth, all 50 of them, meaning that new diseases and climate change they are unable to adapt to, which means that it could kill them off just like that.
And so, and so as we see, it was recorded in 2012 that there were about 70 of them. Eight years later, we're sitting here and there are 50. And it's still decreasing, and if something's not done, they're going to be extinct before we know. So if we know so much about these sloths, and we know the things that are happening to them, why can't we stop it? And why can't we help them get a natural flourishing habitat? Well, because we're the problem. These mangrove trees on the island are being cut down by the people who are local. And although they are using it to sustain their own temporary homes, because they do not inhabit the island year round, they do use it and they go out and they cut down the largest tree they can find in these thickets and they create their homes, leaving less room for the soft oak. And then there's tourists. So, tourism is a very large issue on this island because, especially with human interaction, sloths aren't very good with being interrupted from their things. And one of the largest problems with tourism is that there's not an enforcement of the protection that this island should have. Or the protection that the island does have. And then there's trapping. And trapping is harmful to many species, almost all of them. And especially with sloths. Sloths can be treated as if they were porcelain. They are extremely fragile and they get stressed extremely easily. Any amount of stress can cause damage to their respiratory and their digestive system, which leads to 80 to 90 percent of all sloths that are trafficked dying. If all of these sloths were to be trafficked, there would be no more than five at best. The sloth that I have in my hand is purple, it smells nice, and it has cute eyes. This sloth right here sells to humans. Contrast it with an actual sloth that's maybe not so nice smelling. It has algae growing in its hair, and it farts out of their mouths. Yes. That sloth is highly less marketable than a sloth that right here, as I described, is purple and has nice eyes. Marketers did this because they wanted to sell the sloths, but by doing so, misinformed many people, and the sloths are facing the effects to this day. The fascination and desire uh, to see the sloth is because marketers made them so appealing, and this is the reason why the pygmy three-toed sloth is having its environment being overrun. Marketing, however, can be good if used correctly. With many interested in sloths because of marketing, awareness movements could be very, very effective, and these sloths could be supported by bad solutions. This could also stop people from visiting the island, and human interactions could be limited, which would benefit the sloths greatly, as humans are what are killing these sloths. And there's some more uh, influenced sloths that are causing this fascination with the sloths and so with all of the attention being drawn to these sloths, although there are many positive attention through all the organizations such as EDGE, which will be touched upon more later, there's also negative attention. Tourism is still a problem, no matter how little it may be. And these sloths do not need that, and they could be destroyed by us just within the moment. And so why should you care? Well, although it may be 
just a sloth on some random island in the middle of the Caribbean. It's more than just that. Because if we don't care about this, why should we care about the polar bears? A sloth and a polar bear are facing the same problems. Their environment is being destroyed around them, their habitat reduced to nothing by our actions. And if we do not do something to help them, they will die. And so, if we don't care about one, why should we care about the other? If we care about none of it, we lose it all. And then what do we have left? It is clear that research for saving the pygmy three-toed sloth is behind in comparison to how critical the sloth endangerment is. With estimates that there are just roughly 50 sloths left, it is extremely concerning that researchers don't even have precise numbers. Although research is behind, there is one project that is making the biggest difference by far. And this is the EDGE project, as it continues to work towards understanding the sloths better day in and day out. Although they are fighting a losing battle with minimal research, they are working the hardest to produce new information that will deter people from Escudo de Veraguas. If we listen to specialists like the Endangered Species Coalition, by picking one project already underway to support, and we pick EDGE to be that project, we can truly give the sloths an edge in their fight for survival. Volunteering for a project like EDGE is also a perfect way to get to see sloths and you can support organizations like EDGE by and um, make physical differences and you can see them. And donating to projects like this is also another very simple but effective way of making a great difference. Even with lacking research, it is very evident that even though EDGE is working as hard as they can, they simply, simply cannot save the sloth species on their own. With numbers constantly dropping and new numbers reaching below 50, it is clear that the time to act is now. But how are people like us going to make a difference when the EDGE team works with these animals physically every day and they still can't stop their decline? To answer this, we must understand that the EDGE team cannot change laws on their own, and they cannot create mass amounts of awareness on their own as well. And if they cannot create mass amounts of awareness, how are the locals going to know that their, their, their visits on this island are creating drastic effects on the sloth? Supporting movements like these are huge steps that everyday people like us can do to save the sloths that the EDGE team can't do on their own. People can also adopt a sloth, where you adopt a sloth that represents the sloth in the community. And you get a stuffed animal, and the money that you spend buying the stuffed animal is going to projects like EDGE or other projects that are helping the sloth survive. Some of these sloths can be Pocahontas here that you can support. And another way to support could be signing petitions that could create stricter traveling laws or create higher fines for um, trespassing. And if done successfully, this support can give the pygmy sloths enough freedom from humans to prosper in the lands they are adapted for and begin to thrive once again on the lands that should be humanless. I completely understand. This harmless animal always has a cute grin on its face. It can swim and is truly adorable and hard to resist seeing yourself. And with marketers portraying them as cuter than they actually are, I cannot fault anyone for falling victim into wanting to see this mammal. However, saving the sloth cannot be a project that only the EDGE team fights for. It is up to us as humans to prevent the sloth from deforestation by raising awareness. It is up to us as humans to volunteer time into saving the animals we harmed when we fell victim to their adorable marketing. And it is up to us as humans to make a change and to stop the tragedies that take place on Escudo de Veraguas. Because it was us, humans, who caused this tragedy in the first place. Thank you.
Hello. So today I'm going to be talking about animal testing. My name is Blair Fetler. And so first I'm going to introduce to you my little pal. Does anybody want to name him? Katie. Tim. Tim? Okay, this is Tim. I'm going to pass this to Garb and then you can just pass it around and meet him. He's okay. He's okay. Sure, he's a team. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So, what exactly is animal testing? And there's a lot of misconceptions about it. And I know before I started researching this, I thought that this was animal testing because, you know, where else would like makeup and products go other than your face and like blush and eyeshadow and lipstick, I all thought that they just put it on the animal and then saw how the animal reacted, which, as you can see, is pretty funny and ridiculous. And so the reality is very harsh and very unpleasant to see. So this is cats, which is more uncommon, but pretty much this is um, the raise, or the LD50 test, and pretty much they pump a large amount of product into the animal's stomach, um, which is very uncomfortable, very unsettling, and very painful to this animal. And so they do it on a very wide variety, which you'll see very soon. And pretty much 50% of these subjects die, but if they don't die within a few days, a few weeks, or a month, then the animal is just killed and euthanized. And so this can, like I said, take months to kill this animal off, and it is torture to them because they don't see light. They are just stuck in this lab for their entire lives, and this is all they ever know. And so this is another example. This is very, very common with mice and rats. And if you ever like look on a label or something, it might say, don't take it if you're pregnant or any of that. And so they take pregnant rice and rat, rice and mice and rats. <laughs> Sorry. And um, they get them pregnant and then see how they will react to a substance. And if it's poorly, then they'll put it on the label. And so this is called the Dry's test. And so it's most commonly done on bunnies. And so they're caged like in that photo. And they pretty much just get absolutely demolished in the eye. They take syringes stab it right into the eye, take substances, stab it right into the eye. It's pretty much like acid to the eye to these animals. And so it causes a lot, a lot of irritation, as you can see. And it's not safe for these animals. It practically kills them, it makes them go blind, it makes them their eyes irritated. And this is a very unreliable test because this cannot tell what it's going to do on humans. There are so many more effective ways to do this on humans, and this is not effective to tell if a product is safe or not. And so as you can tell, this isn't just mice and rats that have a low intelligence. They test on monkeys, which is very sad because their intelligence are like humans. They're so smart and they can feel pain just like us. And so this to me was very, very unsettling and not okay. okay. And so it also happens on dogs. This Pretty much they put these masks around their snouts. And so beagles are the most common, which the picture isn't great, but you can still tell that they're beagles. And they're forced to inhale these products to see if they're safe. And so beagles can't bark because they don't have vocal cords. So that's what makes them so ideal for this test. And their snouts fit perfectly into that. And so safe and effective alternatives. There's so, so many other ways we can test on animals but we choose, or to test products, but we choose not to because animal testing is very known and it's very familiar and humans don't like change. So this is one way. Um, this is pretty much the eye test and it's a synthetic, synthetic material that replicates the eye and it reacts uh, more like a human eye than a bunny's eye. So this test is 87% more effective than a bunny's test, which is only 61% effective in replicating that real like material and that real feeling. So pretty much they put it in a clamp and it looks like an eye, and then they take the material, put it into the eye, and then they see what happens. 
And so if it's okay, then that means it's okay. But if it's not, then they just remake the formula until it is okay. And so this is another very, very effective way, and it's cell cultures. So it's pretty much a replicate of cells in the lab. And it's so much more effective than real animals because real animals cannot tell how humans are going to react. So they do all these tests and all these animals die constantly for no reason. And so it's a 3D structure of cells and it's a very realistic way to tell how we would react as humans to these products. And so these are now products that everyone can participate in. We're going to see what products are tested on animals and which products aren't tested on animals. So who thinks that acts tests on animals? Yes, you are right. They test on animals. Bert's bees? They do not test on animals. So this is a very safe product. They have lots and lots of products. Any range, very safe for animals, very safe for the environment. And uh, so, yes, they do not test on animals, which they did, and then recently they just switched into animal. Dawn dish soap with the cute little ducks. Who thinks they test? They do, and so this is a very misleading way because obviously there's ducks on it, and it says that it's good for animals, like you can bring a few dogs in it. I know that I used to do that sometimes, but this is not safe. They still test on animals. Bath and Body Works, all products, yes, they do test on animals, which is really upsetting because they have so many products and it's marketed to so many people. All these, this is kind of a big one, all these products. There's Windex, there's toothpaste, there's blood spray, all that. So these products do test on animals, all of these. And it's so more, much more common than we think it is, and it's very disturbing once you kind of find out what tech or what products are really being tested on. And so these, so companies are very, very secretive when it comes to animal testing because they will send in the documentation saying, no, we don't test on animals, but it's never like actually confirmed. So in their lab, they will actually be tested on animals. So these are some big ones that people will put onto their labels. And if they get caught, there's barely any punishment. They don't check and make sure they're not testing on animals again, which is really, really sad. So these are like fake ones. And the ones with the pink little bunny ears, those are all very confirmed, very safe to use, very animal friendly. And so now, little Tim, I think that's the name, yes, little bear, this is his brother. So, yes, animals will also be shaved like in the back and have the product rubbed into their skin, which is very, if you've ever had like a skin sensitivity, you know it's very, very uncomfortable. And so this is the little tube that was placed into the stomach pumping like the dog is breathing in. The eye has been cut out bloody. The ear, same thing. So this is just like representation. He didn't make it home. So I know what can everybody do today. So you can start by signing petitions. So uh, PETA is a great, great organization that helps animals just in general. Um, they have lots of petitions. You can donate, you can volunteer. It's a very good company that is very trusted. And there's obviously change.org, which is more exact. So it has certain companies that people are trying to sign petitions and to make sure that they're animal safe. And then make sure that the labels on the back of like any product have that little logo of these bunnies. And just don't buy the products. And lastly, save the animals, because it's really sad. I mean, animals are treated like trash. Thank you. Thank you all for attending day one of our TED Talk conference. I hope that some of you will make it to day two. Thank you for being such a great audience. Uh, I think it's time for mass breaks, so let's go ahead. <laughs>